What's up, everybody? Steve Barton here. Thank you for tuning in. Please hit the like and subscribe button with a little bell notification icon. We have returning guest, rock star Rick Rule. Uh, Rick, thank you for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure, Steve. Thank you for having me back. Yes. Uh, so we're going to go over uh, companies that you, the listener, submitted uh, for Rick. And uh, remember, keep in mind that this is a snapshot in time. Uh, what uh, Rick's opinions uh, uh, right now may, uh, you know, things change with the company. It may be different a couple of months from now. Um, but um, anyhow, I want, to, uh, I want to start off with uh, uranium. It, uh, as of now, I've got about 2% of my net worth in uh, uranium. And every time I'm, I'm thinking about buying more, uh, the last conversation I had with Justin Hune, we were talking about some principal risks. And uh, number one, at least in my mind, is probably a 1929 style depression that would just create less of a need for energy and electricity as a whole, you know, nobody's going to be buying a Tesla in a, in a, in a depression. Um, number two would probably be some type of plant accident, you know, like another Fukushima, which would bring us from being contrarians to just straight up wrong. Is it, <laughs> is that kind of the, the, uh, what you're seeing or is, yeah, I, I'd, is I'd probably reverse the order of your risks. Uh, I'd okay. say a plant failure is number one. Uh, or uh, a war-related failure in the Ukraine uh, around that nuclear fleet. Something that happened that made people afraid again about the uh, safe efficacy of nu nuclear power would be a big problem. My suspicion is that a recession would be less problematic than you think because uranium is so extraordinarily economically efficient. The more exotic forms of power uh, would be the ones that would suffer unduly uh, in the event of a recession or depression. When we're all very rich, we can afford solar in Germany or Sweden where the sun doesn't shine. But that becomes uh, a luxury when our ability to afford things uh, becomes less than it has been over the last 40 years. So I would suggest that your fear of recession or depression, while it would slow the growth of nuclear power, would do almost nothing to undermine nuclear's existing market share as a simple fact uh, that once the plants are built, it's the densest and most efficient form of power on earth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's still so cheap. I think Justin said right now that the cost of, uh, uh, of the fuel, when you incorporate overhead and, and, and everything and permits and all that is uh, like 10% or something. So even in Less. doubling... Oh, it's less. even less than that. Less, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, if, if you're amortizing the six or seven billion dollars it costs you to build a nuclear plant, never mind the pantheon of lawyers and things that you need to <laughs> comply with the regulations that keep it running. Uh, the truth is, ironically, that the fuel cost relative to the price of the product that you produce is inconsequential. Okay. All right. Um, is there any other risks that that could be out there that uh, that I'm not thinking of? I mean, the one that keeps me awake is some form of plant or transportation failure uh, or, uh, you know, in the current shooting war in northern Ukraine, something going wrong with one of those facilities. Okay. Okay. All right. And these things, if you shut them down, you need to shut them down properly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the, yeah. probability, the probability of failure is extremely low. The penalty for failure is extraordinarily high. Okay. okay. All right. Um, another one that I keep coming back to, and, and maybe it's simply because each of these plants has a few years supply uh, sitting on site, but why in the world would uranium miners mine this stuff at, at 60 or $61 a pound? And, 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 and like you said, try to make it up on volume when they're getting paid 50 bucks a pound. Is it because Kazakhstan can do it? Or I'm sorry, because Adam Prom can do it at, at, at 25. And, and so they're making a profit. And this is just a general blanket over the whole sector. Or? That's one problem. The second problem is what's called the last man standing problem. It's expensive to shut up that plant down and more expensive a plant by a plant. I mean, a mine and more expensive to bring it back online. And so some people prefer to try and tough out the trough 
rather than going through the expense of shutting it down and reopening it. I suspect the real problem is what I call real yield. Uh, from a manager's point of view, a real yield is his or her salary. And the idea, if you shut a mine down, that you likely make yourself redundant, uh, you are more inclined to inflict pain on shareholders to preserve your own salary than you do than you are to do what would otherwise be the rational thing and shut down redundant capacity. I've seen the real e yield issue bedevil the mining industry for the nearly 50 years that I've been in it. All right. Um, what is your opinion? Uh, myself and my followers bought uh, Cameco uh, the day after they uh, acquired uh, Westinghouse. Right. And so far, we're looking pretty smart. Uh, what, what, what is your thought with that whole acquisition? And um, uh, what, what's your thoughts on the company right now? I'm afraid of the acquisition. I, I think if they make it work, it's brilliant because Cameco will have the ability to really truly be a full cycle company. Uh, they'll have the ability to mine the stuff, process it. Uh, in conjunction with Brookfield, they will actually have the financial capability to build and operate uh, new nuclear power plants. The company has made no secret of their wish to sell watts in addition to selling uranium. Yeah. Strategically, the narrative, I think, is absolutely fantastic. It also is an amazing vote of faith in the nuclear industry. Uh, what scares me, uh, and partially it's personal, I've never been able to operate one business well at any period in time. And I'm scared about mining guys that are going into the engineering business or the plant construction business. Uh, just from a practical point of view, and I'm prepared to concede that Isaacs and Gitler and all those guys are a lot smarter than me, but I'm always afraid you know, in little boy parlance, that if you go out of your sandbox into the next door neighbor's sandbox, where in your sandbox, you could beat him up uh, over in his sandbox, he can beat you up. And, and so that's the thing that scares me about this, this sort of, you know, idea that they're circling from their core competence in pursuit of strategic goals and narrative, and, and that they might not be able to pay it to make it pay. That's what scares me. I'm delighted that they choose to do it in conjunction with Brookfield who has been able for years to operate in numerous businesses and has the uh, access to capital and the financial sophistication to literally build nuclear power plants from scratch uh, or uh, build new world-class processing and reprocessing capacity to match the Russian capacity that's politically constrained now or to engineer and pop and uh, uh, operate uh, waste disposal facilities. Um, the fact that they have a partnership with Brookfield who commonly raises a, a billion dollars to build something and on occasion raises $5 billion to build something means that if Cameco can overcome the operational challenges, which scare me, their ability to compete because they have the technology in not just the SMR, the small modular space, uh, but also in the world scale nuclear power plants uh, is very, very, very exciting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They, they, your, your principal fear is that they may be spreading themselves in a business that, that they haven't, haven't proven themselves yet. I have occasionally in my youth gotten my uh, nose bloody going places that I shouldn't have stuck it. So. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to move on to bonds here. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen real quick. And uh, this is uh, this is the TLT. Uh, I just bought a small uh, position this morning. And uh, the, the falling knife here. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on uh, on bonds? If you could just go through a, uh, um, you know, what you think of bonds at the moment? The Treasury market scares me less because it's liquid uh, and because if they need to, they can print money. In other words, they can pay you off with counterfeit money, okay. which is a good thing. The arithmetic around the long treasury bothers me a lot. Uh, they talk about a real yield, but when they talk about a real yield, they're projecting inflation down. Uh, the real arithmetic as it sits right now 
in the U.S. 10-year Treasury is horrific. Yeah. They pay you foreign change in a currency that they acknowledge is losing its purchasing power at almost nine. Uh, they're guaranteeing you a 500 basis point loss on an annual basis. Now, I need to say I have a very good former client. I'm retired from that part of the business now. Who owns a lot of U.S. 10s. And I took him through the arithmetic. I said, you know, a 5% guaranteed loss doesn't sound very cool to me. He says, yeah, I get it, but it beats the hell out of a 15 or 20% loss. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's just sort of parking uh, in the bonds. I personally am parked in the one, the one-year bond. I don't want to take duration li li risk. And the idea that they're paying me more for a one-year than they would pay me for a 10-year is amazing to me. But that's not the part of the bond market that scares me. Uh, the treasuries are just going to be arithmetic. It's the largest and most liquid uh, securities market in the world. We have the, the most easy to understand and well-documented economy in the world. What scares me is lower credit quality. Uh, state and local issuers in the United States who can't print but are arguably insolvent uh, foreign issuers, particularly emerging and frontier market economies, where they generate the means of repayment in currencies that are falling rapidly and have to pay their debt in U.S. dollars. Uh, and frankly, raised money on credit terms that don't exist anymore. Do you realize that Argentina was able to sell a 100-year bond? Uh, if history is a guide, Argentina will default eight times in the course of that bond's existence. Uh, the credit markets that existed some years ago were incredible. But the thing that worries me even more, I don't want to make your people depressed, but the thing that really keeps me awake night is the corporate junk debt market. The ability that these guys have, first of all, to refund uh, and what might happen to them uh, in recession. And those fears are compounded, uh, Steve, by the structure of that market. These instruments frequently trade over the counter. They're frequently unlisted. They frequently don't trade. But the owners of these increasingly are ETFs, Ma's and Pa's around the country who were chasing yield. These ETFs hold trillions of dollars of junk bonds. And the ETFs trade like water. So the investors think that the assets are liquid. No problem. I go to sell my ETF. They sell the underlying securities. I get paid. That's okay unless there's some sort of concern about credit. If there's concern about credit and a bunch of people go to redeem, the underlying securities are illiquid. When I came up in the junk bond markets in the 70s and 80s, we had something that was called an owl bond. An owl bond is when you call your broker and say sell, and he says, to who? To who? And I... I have this ugly sense that if we have something that makes cons people concerned about their bonds, and there's nothing in the world that would make me more concerned than owning a 4% yield in a currency that was depreciating by 9%, yeah. but, uh, I, I could see a tremendous dislocation in the junk bond markets because of these ETFs. So I'm afraid of all these things. I mean, the arithmetic is lousy. We saw from the London gilt market when it broke three or four weeks ago, the fact that many investors don't understand the purchase, the purpose of a bond. They were owning these long bonds ostensibly to maintain purchasing power, but then they were leveraging a 30-year position in the overnight credit market. When the interest rate rose and it reduced the capitalized value of the bond, while at the same time increasing the borrower's interest co uh, costs, some of the biggest pension funds in the world were getting squeezed because they were involved in an idiotic speculation around duration. So for all those reasons, the structure of credit markets globally uh, has me, I mean, I'm not panicked, but if I was to look for a place that was ripe to go wrong, it's the bond market, in particularly the, bond, the long bond market. I mean, Steve, imagine okay. yourself, okay? You're not doing what you're doing now. You're running uh, a pension plan. 
and you're looking after the retirement of people who are going to quit work in 20 years from now or 30 years from now. And you got to make sure that their current contributions make enough money. They retire 20 years from now or 30 years from now. So you're putting a bunch of this money in the long bond. That worked well for 40 years because the interest rate fell. We yeah. spent the capitalized value, the distributions went up. But that party's over. Now you got the guys in 30-year U.S. treasuries paying for and your 9% a year depreciation, uh, meaning that you're guaranteeing that their purchasing power over time is declining. At the same time, with the interest rate rising, that the capitalized value of the income stream they hold is falling. I mean, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you, the structure of your current portfolio, and these, current, these portfolios are normally 60% bonds, 40% equity. The composition of that portfolio uh, over the last two years has guaranteed a loss. Guaranteed a loss. And you you got to find a way out of that. Now, the big thinkers of the world believe that with an increase in interest rates, we're going to tamper inflation. And the consequence of that is getting paid 4% in a, in a world where your yield uh, is real, which is to say the depreciation of the dollar is only 2% a year. That works. Uh, I saw this movie before in the 70s. I remember all through the decade of the 70s, the big thinkers were saying, inflation's going to be under control. Whip inflation now. You know, we're going to do all those things. It wasn't until Volcker came in and got real uh, that that happened. And the circumstance that would make it real, which is to say a dramatic rise in interest rates, would murder the capitalized value of the income stream. If you bought a U.S. 30-year treasury yield four, and Volcker came in, the 30-year treasury was suddenly yielding 15, uh, your $1,000 bond would trade on the market at 300. It would, <laughs> <laughs> it would be a sobering, or perhaps it would cause you to drift away from sobering experiences. At any rate, it would not be pleasant. Okay, okay. Um... What um, I'm sorry, you're, you're sorry you asked the question, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm 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 really rethinking this bet right now because uh, my plan was to uh, purchase a little bit over the next uh, uh, few months. Uh, right. Probably it's going to continue to go down as as the Fed keeps in, increasing uh, uh, right. rates, but at some point they're going to have to to pivot, I would think, right? Which would bring the value yeah. of the uh, Steve. I'm just not a bond trader. I own bonds for different reasons. Uh, I own bonds to lock in positive credit spreads. Uh, and this market is not cooperating with locking in credit spreads. Uh, I, through most of my life, have maintained fa a fairly good bond portfolio because my background is a credit analyst. It's what I do. You know, I look for anomalies in the credit space. And I look at the credit space now, and I think other than structured credits where I structure them myself, I'm not smart enough to buy these damn bonds. You are right. If they pivot, uh, you're going to have a good time with that 20. Uh, my problem is that when I look at markets in the future, <laughs> my crystal ball's cracked and cloudy. And I got to I gotta see a way in my mind to make it pay now. Not, you know, I'm too old for those sort of speculative bounces. Okay. I'm trying to catch a falling knife. All right. <laughs> Maybe not, but it's not the way I invest in bonds. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the portfolio review. Um, uh, KL asks about uh, PBR. Uh, the name? I don't know. I, uh, it was a, uh, uh, shoot, I'll look it up here in a sec. We'll come back to that one. Uh, this one I know you know. Uh, Encore, ENCUF. Yeah, I mix, to be honest, on Encore. I, I would prefer not to answer simply because <clears throat> it's sort of under review from my viewpoint. So I'll have to pass on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just looked up uh, PBR. It's a uh, Petrolio Brasileiro. Uh, oh, Petrobras. Petrobras. Okay. That's yeah. Funny. Not for the faint of heart. Uh, not for the faint of heart. Very, very, very cheap on a price cash flow, price pre-cash, free cash flow, price book basis, uh, does well at high petroleum prices. 
it's in effect an arm of the Brazilian state, uh, which is both good and bad. My suspicion is that the call on the resources of uh, Petrobras with the newly elected leftist administration in Brazil will mean that an increasing amount of the free cash flow from Petrobras will be distributed to all shareholders, which are great for people who, looks for di who look for dividends. The difficulty is that if you distribute too much of free cash flow, you permanently impair the company's ability to continue to pay those dividends. You can't defer too much sustaining capital. Uh, one other comment about the company that's both a positive and a negative. They have huge frontier resources, subsalt, uh, out in the Atlantic. The challenge there is that you're drilling deep, deep wells in ultra deep water, and you're drilling it through uh, a cap that's salt. And the problem is that that salt is moving slightly. Oh. You can imagine the technical challenges of having 2,000 feet of steel going through a salt dome that's migratory. It isn't so difficult if you have a little bit of salt on the drill string. And it might not be a problem for the engineers. I My mind boggles if I try to think how I have, you know, a 12-inch diameter hole with steel through 2,000 feet of salt, and that salt is ever so slowly on the move. Uh, that's the bad news. I don't understand it. The good news is that there are billions of barrels there. Um, it is, for me, not the right juxtaposition of risk to reward, given what I'm trying to accomplish in my own account. In the investment part of my own account, I'm looking for outcomes that while they might not be as rosy if everything works out, where there's less downside and less uncertainty. At the same time, in the speculative part of my account, I'm looking for much smaller companies where the impact of some change that I see or the impact of exploration success would be higher. So it sits sort of in a gap uh, where, although I'm really interested in the company, it doesn't fit any need that I have in my own portfolio. Um, you've got quite a follower here because his uh, name is Rick Fool, and he <laughs> asks about uh, Aurora Energy. I don't know enough to comment. Okay. Uh, Strathmore plus Uranium Corp. Uh, Strathmore was sold some time ago. Um, so I don't know what issue where he's referring to. Okay, he just wrote Strathmore, and then I typed it. I'd never heard of it. I typed it into Google, and then it came up as a uranium corporation. Yeah, so there was a Strathmore Uranium, which was uh, sold some years ago. Uh, it spun off something called Fission, uh, which is a current holding of mine. Fission Uranium Corp? Yep. Okay. What, uh, what do you think of that one? Uh, I'm a holder. They have a... A satellite deposit to the wonderful aero deposit controlled by NextGen. Relationships between the two companies are not good, uh, but they should merge. These two deposits are built sort of 300 miles west of infrastructure. Both deposits would be will be built, but it would be a shame to have duplicate mill facilities, duplicate generation facilities, duplicate work at worker housing. And my hope is that somebody, you know, a Rio Tinto, a BHP, a Cameco, takes over both. Uh, Fission is a high grade deposit. It's a good size deposit. It's just not as good as the deposit next door. Uh, I own them both. Okay. Uh, he also asks Uranium Corp. I, I assume he's talking about Uranium Energy Corporation or possibly Uranium Royalty? He's either talking about UEC, Uranium Energy, or Uranium Royalty. Uh, both stocks, I think, are ahead of themselves. Okay. Both stocks uh, have benefited uh, from millions of dollars of financial public relations expenditures. So they both have very, very large and very loyal constituencies. Both stocks are particularly geared to perception around uranium. And I think perception around uranium uh, increases markedly. UEC just made a great acquisition at Rough Rider, uh, a real uh, addition to their portfolio by way of quality. Uranium royalty has been uh, understandably fairly slow to deploy the proceeds that they raise. They're spending the money prudently. 
what that means is that you're buying promise there because what it really is right now is an overpriced money market fund. Uh, it's a sort of a cash pool looking to be deployed, by the way, by very good people at capital deployment. I'm not criticizing them. Uh, the company will probably, pardon me, the companies will probably always trade at a premium to their respective values relative to the uranium sector because they've built such a very large and very loyal shareholder following. Okay. Okay. But in, in, in your mind, they, uh, if you had to give them one of your, uh, uh, your, uh, uh, one through 10, what I have uh, UEC at a five, I have uranium royalty at a six. Oh, okay. Uh, I would love to raise uranium royalties rating, but I need to see what they spend the money on. Okay. Right now, there's too much uncertainty. It's all promise and not so much uranium. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but very bright guys run it. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Carlos from Spain, and um, he wants to ask about uh, gold mining. He said uh, you gave it a you gave this company a five when he sent you his uh, portfolio yep. to review. Um, what um, he said. Why is this company with such a tremendous portfolio of assets still not valued by the market and by Mr. Rule? Uh, most of the assets are out of the money. Uh, Amir Adnani, who by the same way, same, who by the way is the same guy who started UEC and uranium royalty. Uh, Amir Adnani did a wonderful job over 15 years when gold assets were cheap, buying gold assets that were out of the money. They're by and large still out of the money, which is to say at today's capital costs and today's cost of capital, different things, uh, at today's uh, gold price, mostly what you see in Gold Mining Inc. is optionality to higher gold prices. If you're somebody who sees $23, $24, $2,500 gold, you can own this for what it will be worth. I buy things based on the price that's in my computer today. Uh, and at those prices, um, there isn't a lot of excess value other than optionality. What there is, is a new management team that is extremely adroit at monetizing existing assets, sales, spin outs, investment banking, merchant banking. And I think what you'll see in gold royalty is increasing amounts of shareholder value being added pre-production. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I want to see a couple transactions, just like I want to see a couple transactions in uranium royalty. When you tell me what you're going to do, you can get me excited to watch the stock. When you do something, you can get me excited about buying the stock. But those are two different circumstances. Need to deploy. Okay. Um, all right. Doc asks, uh, it's not a specific company, but he says uh, more detail on how he picks his stocks. Maybe an actual example of a random company from each of the sector explorer, developer, mid cap major. Yeah. So two different short form answers. The first is, is as an investor, I would define an investor who's as somebody who makes uh, capital allocations with the reasonable expectation of a reasonable rate of return in probabilistic circumstances, which is to say the sensible deployment of capital. I am one of those. I'm also a speculator. Uh, a speculator is somebody who is looking at circumstances where the outcome could be described as a probability, a possibility, pardon me, rather than a probability, a uh, much leave it less than even chance of success. But where as a consequence of taking more risk, you're looking for above average rates of return. In speculations, I look, first of all, at sectors that are out of favor, or I look at circumstances, say, a recent drill hole that the market hasn't, from my point of view, perceived correctly. Uh, something that shades the odds in my favor. I'm extremely selective in, sp in speculation understanding that nine times out of 10, a speculative decision results in at least part partial failure. So you need some real rewards to justify the sort of one in 10 probability of uh, technical success. On the investment side, to me, it's all about the delta between uh, the net present value of your future cash flows uh, relative to your enterprise value. So if the net present value of future cash flows is $10 billion in your enterprise value, which is to say market cap uh, minus cash 
uh, pardon me, plus cash minus uh, minus debt. If that number's uh, at a reasonable discount, uh, which is to say that you're buying uh, a probabilistic cash flow stream at a reasonable discount, I do it. Uh, I simply do it. I look at something like Exxon Mobil where everybody in the world hates oil, except for when they go to turn the key to the right in the car, uh, and then they like it. Uh, and I look at the probabilistic free cash flows at various uh, oil prices uh, and various costs of capital. And I look at the probability that people six years from now will want their car to start and want their homes to stay warm. Uh, and I get attracted to a name like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's call it a bond substitute, uh, you know, one where the dividend yields go up, uh, but where the probabilities stay the same. Um, okay. Uh, one of your popular ones, uh, BHP. What number would you give that? Or how, do you, how do you feel about it uh, now? I have BHP as a four with the chance of it going to three. I want to see a little bit of improvement in the Chinese economy. Specifically, I want to see Mr. G walk away a little bit from shutting down the economy with regards to COVID. Uh, BHP is a great company. They have really great long-lived assets, huge assets. They're in the bottom cost quartile in everything they produce. But a lot of what they produce, particularly iron ore, which is the most important thing that they do, is very China dependent. They made two, I think, good moves in the last 10 years. One spinning off their secondary mines into South 32. Uh, some people say that was non-accretive from a free cash basis, but what it did do is leave them only crown jewels and no distractions. Uh, and they've decided that they're subscale in oil. So they spun off their uh, oil business uh, into Woodside. Uh, creating, uh, you know, one of the 30 largest oil companies in the world. Very, very, very shareholder-friendly maneuvers. Uh, so for the long term, I'm extremely attracted to BHP. What can go wrong with BHP can be summed up in one word, recession. Uh, if we have a global synchronized economic slowdown, uh, producers of copper, producers of aluminum, producers of steel, uh, iron, won't escape unscathed. In the long term, the chance of something going wrong with BHP is extremely limited. In the near term, with a recession, the chance that it could be cheaper now, four years from now, than it is today is high. Uh, you get compensated with an incredible dividend uh, and a shareholder-friendly management that when they get extra cash building up, which seems to happen every year, they have the extremely good manners of passing it back to the owners, uh, which is a really good thing. Yeah, I got BHP for the first time, I think, two years ago. And even though the purchase price was uh, higher than it is now, uh, I'm a fraction of a percent up or down simply because of the dividends and the Woodside acquisition. Um, okay, uh, Ken Ross Gold. Uh, I think Ken Ross has a challenged history of asset deployment. I don't own Ken Ross. Uh, it could be with the recent Great Bear acquisition that with some more drilling, uh, you know, there are some people who say that's a 10 million ounce deposit that they bought for a billion dollars. I can't see those 10 million ounces myself, but I hope I'm wrong. Uh, they made a disastrous acquisition uh, earlier in the country company's history around Tassiat. Uh, but again, it falls in a hole uh, that doesn't suit my portfolio. For part of my portfolio, I... I believe that the biggest gold mining companies in the world <clears throat> valued by the metric net asset value to enterprise value are at all time lows, maybe not cheap, but at least reasonably priced relative to other industries, which is cheap as gold goes. So those companies, the barracks of the world, the Francos of the world, the Wheatons of the world, I love and I own them in size. Uh, I also own smaller companies where I either think that I see things that the market doesn't see or because of the inefficiency of smaller markets where I see valuation discrepancies. There are at least 200 people in the world who know more, than Ken, know more about Kinross than me. It doesn't offer me the probabilities that Barrick or Franco offers me. Uh, it also doesn't give me the same 
uh, leveraged upside to an inefficient market. So it falls into a gap where it isn't useful for me. Kinross could be very useful for somebody who believes that we're going to see 23 or 24 or $2,500 gold in the next two years. It's extremely leveraged to higher gold prices, given the very low enterprise value per reserve ounce and the very low enterprise value per, per production ounce. It's really leveraged to higher gold prices. And I'm not, uh, I'm not one who is against the argument of increased gold prices. Uh, after almost 50 years in the business, however, I want to get the impact of higher gold prices for free. <laughs> I, I, I want to make money even if the gold price doesn't change. I want corporate efficiencies at a reasonable price now, or I want the chance of some upside around production increases or discovery. And Kinross doesn't fit either book. The third place that one could buy Kinross, given the recent uh, announcements around Yamana, the new takeover uh, of Yamana by Agnico and Pan American, uh, there is a whole range of companies in the middle of the market, Kinross being uh, one of them, where substantial value could be added by, in fact, amalgamating it with somebody else, reducing the GNA by combining two companies, increasing the scope and scale. And it could be that a surprise could come in Kinross, you know, uh, by way of some sort of transaction that I haven't factored in. Okay. Is it leveraged to gold? Kind of like the next one on the list that everyone asked about was uh, First Majestic. Is, is it leveraged to gold, kind of like First Majestic's leveraged oh, to first, silver? First Majestic is probably more leveraged. Uh, first Majestic is leveraged twice, though. Uh, first Majestic has operational leverage. The reason that I don't own First Majestic anymore is they bought Jarrett Canyon. Now, they have a great track record of buying these old aged mines that have been stripped for cash, that have been cannibalized, adding the cash back and resuscitating the mines. Jarrett Canyon, if they can do that, will be a long ball home run. But you have to show me. Uh, you know, I'm fine if I have to pay a little more, if I take away the operational uncertainty about Jarrett Canyon. Heath Newmeyer is a brilliant guy. Remember, he's assembled this company from scratch over 20 years. And twice before in his career, he has bought old, aged, tired, cash-starved mines lavish the love and attention on them that was necessary to turn them around and his shareholders have benefited mightily if he can pull that off with jared canyon you know <laughs> it'll be the proverbial hat trick but i'm not in the if business anymore okay um wheat and precious metals what's a, you still a four on that one or yeah yeah i i see that as a no-brainer uh randy smallwood is a very nice very smart, very honest guy. I trust him. I've known him long enough that I believe that my intuition is good. I've watched him for three decades. You know, I was there at the inception of the company. They have very high quality assets. They have a great balance sheet. They have great access to cash. And I really believe that streaming will be an increasingly important part of the capital stack of mine development for the next 15 or 20 years. And I think, you know, uh, Wheaton... Franco, uh, to a lesser extent, Royal Gold and Osisco are really in the sweet spot in terms of their size. You know, I, I see multi-billion dollar streaming transactions taking place in the next 10 years. Everybody says the streaming business is over. All the capital that can be deployed has been deployed. And I just think that's way, way, way wrong. Okay. Um, G. Roy, uh, Gold Royalty Corporation. Uh, Gold Royalty Corporation, uh, uh, I would echo the comments probably that I made with regards to Uranium Royalty and Gold Mining Inc. Gold Royalty is a spinoff of Gold Mining Inc. They did a wonderful job of figuring out that royalties trade at a, on a higher unit basis than working interest for good reason. So they created a bunch of royalties from scratch <laughs> out of the inventory that they had in Gold Mining Inc., raised a bunch of money, uh, and brought in some very good guys to run it. But it's a work in progress. Uh, I would need to see better deployment. I would need to see better visibility uh, with regards to their existing inventory. I do need to say that I have a small shareholding there. I used to have a large shareholding. The stock did very well. 
uh, I sold enough that I was able to get the rest of my holding for free <laughs> and pay the capital gains tax. And I become very patient once a stock is free for me. I also am personally fond of and have a lot of respect for Amir Adnani, the entrepreneur behind all of the companies that we've talked about uh, in that context and the new management team that he's brought, brought in. Okay. Um, I got three people that only asked about two stocks and they were both the same, probably uh, real fans of uh, E.B. Tucker, uh, Metalla Royalty and Nova Royalty. Um, Metalla Royalty was extremely well put together, extremely well promoted. They did a really good job of taking advantage of a very strong share price uh, to acquire a range of royalties uh, and fill in the value. I don't own either Nova uh, or Metalla. I believe in the people behind them. I believe in the process of consolidating smaller royalty and streaming companies. I just see better price to value relationships elsewhere in the space. EB and I are uh, personal friends, have been for a very long time. Uh, Brett Heath, who has done the sort of backing and filling transactions, is a great promoter and a good investor. Uh, I just look at a space with 72 companies in it, uh, and I see ones I personally would rather own. Okay. Um, Nutrine. Uh, this, uh, uh, Mark asks about Nutrine. Uh, he, he, he referenced the, uh, uh, says he's a technical trader, and he sees a nice uh, technical bounce. How, how do you see it uh, fundamentally? Uh, I, I was going to say, leave me out of the technical part. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't do that. I mean, that basic business, uh, integrated inputs business, is a very good business. Where I said that I was nervous about Cameco because they were entering into a new area, Nutrien did that 30 years ago. Uh, they have integrated their mining business, their distribution business, and their retail business. That's already done. Uh, I have probably never seen, frankly, a mining company do as good a job in integration as they do. Make no mistake, the inputs markets will come off if the Russia and Ukraine circumstances normalizes. Uh, the prices that we're seeing for inputs are really historically high uh, as a partial consequence of uh, real or threatened embargoes around Russian production. Uh, if you are holding Nutrien for the two-year time frame, you might be discouraged either because peace breaks out, which would be a good thing, or because of a recession. If you're prepared to own the world's preeminent input producer over the 10 year time frame, uh, I think you'll be extremely happy. It's a big, well, not a, I mean, I have a healthy shareholding in the company, uh, enough that I watch it fairly closely. And I'm, if the stock fell by 25 or 30% in price, in a recession, I would be completely unconcerned and I would buy more. There are many people who are unnerved by that type of circumstance. I've lived through enough of them that I'm unbothered. Uh, Matt asks about Southern Copper. I don't know enough about Southern Copper any longer to comment. I don't own it. I don't follow it well enough that I would have any place any value in my comments. Okay. Uh, Sandstorm Gold. Uh, I was a founding shareholder of Sandstorm. I've been with it a very long time. I still have a, a large position. I was distressed, frankly, about all the money they spent buying in shares, only to have them issue new shares at a substantially lower price to do an acquisition. I wasn't the only one who was concerned about that, uh, and the price has fallen. But for me, Sandstorm's in the penalty box. Uh, I need to say I need to see the way they integrate this transaction. Uh, I need to see too uh, the way they continue to grow the company. Uh, I'd like to hear very clear uh, instructions from Nolan. Nolan Watson is the CEO uh, about the valuation process, about how they make a decision whether to buy new assets or use that same money to buy in their own stock thereby increasing the net, net asset value of all the other shareholdings. The company is beginning to be mature, and I want to have a sense of what they're going to be when they grow up. So although they own it, uh, my own shareholdings are in the sort of under-review category. Okay. Um, 
Silvercrest. I love Silvercrest. Okay. It's it's a speculative stock. Uh, I love the deposit. I love what these guys have done. Uh, Just started producing. They're very close to, well, in fact, they are producing, but they're not at nameplate capacity uh, yet. It would appear that they are uh, ahead of schedule and on budget. If I'm right, uh, if they achieve nameplate capacity uh, with the cost that they're talking about, um, stocks a double at these silver prices. Uh, the stock is much better than double at higher silver prices. But I've, as I've told you, I like to get that price related upside for free. Not for the faint of heart, by the way, this is in my speculative position. But I, I think it's an unusually attractive speculation. Okay. Uh, Angela asks about Newmont. Newmont is cheap by most measures. I don't own Newmont personally because too much of their production is from smaller tier two mines. Uh, I like great big, long-lived, multi-year reserves. They have a good project pipeline, a project pipeline that I uh, really like. There's a lot of nice things about it. What I don't like is, uh, you know, I, I see too many smaller mines. Um, I, I love the balance sheet. I love the dividend. I love the pipeline, but I don't own it. Um, that's it for a uh, uh, portfolio review that everyone asks. I listened to an interview of you recently and you mentioned something that i had never thought of uh but uh oil and gas uh royalty and streaming companies right what uh i don't know can you give us maybe two or three that that are yeah. kind of at the top of your list yeah i mean freehold which is a canadian uh, royalty company one of the first royalty companies around uh still i think excellent value for a long-term holder uh arc uh, which is both a royalty and a working interest player in Canada. Uh, extremely well run. Guys I competed against in my youth. And I, when I say competed against, I'm flattering myself. Uh, when they wanted something, they obliterated me. Uh, but I attempted to compete, uh, compete against them, largely unsuccessfully. Uh, Blackstone royalty in the United States. Um, Panhandle Inc., which is becoming less of a royalty company uh, and more of a working interest operator, but still has a very valuable royalty package in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, it, it's a very good space. Uh, it's also a, a, a group of companies that have been around uh, longer than the mineral royalties companies are. They have a higher cost of capital because everybody gives gold companies credit for the fact that when gold moves up in price, it really moves up in price. People have had much less certainty in the last 20 years about the oil price. Of course, the skeptics have been wrong. Uh, generally, they're better businesses than the mineral royalties companies' businesses. Generally, they're better run. Generally, they have lower uh, general administ administrative expense relative to assets under management or free cash flow. Very good sector as far as I'm concerned. Okay. okay. Freehold, Arc, Blackstone, and Panhandle. Yep. And okay. Panhandle is speculative. Somebody should be nervous about Panhandle because it's a company in transition. I've owned it, I'm embarrassed to say, for 30 years. Um, I'm, you know, it's one of those things where three or four years ago when they were paying out a lot by way of dividends, my dividend exceeded my purchase price. It was a wonderful circumstance. Wow. Uh, it's a company in transition now. They're trying to use the royalty cash flow to expand into drilling operations. They're moving out of Texas and Oklahoma, uh, it, you know, into the Marcellus. So it's really a company in transition. Investors would do better to look at the other names that I mentioned. Okay. Okay. In that order. Huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Um you're uh, just a, a compliment here, your, your rural investment media that you've started putting up on YouTube. I just recently found it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how I uh, hadn't, but uh, uh, you're going through uh, with um, Albert. Uh, you talk about alpha, beta. You talk about, yep. uh, uh, it's a really, really cool um, uh, uh, platform, I guess, uh, channel. Uh, so I'll put a link down in the... Uh, in Thank the you. Uh, a big book publisher has been trying for years to get me to write a book about investing in natural resources. And I don't want to. 
So Albert and I are doing what is currently a 12 part classroom series uh, and will probably be expanded into a 30 part classroom series where I try an hour long segments to talk about various aspects of the natural resource investing business and make them accessible to people who haven't like me uh, wasted their whole life in natural resources, people who have lives. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. We've gotten a lot of love back from the market. Um, and so I would uh, encourage anybody to go to rural investment media uh, and look at the, look at the classroom series. Uh, wonderful price. It's free. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm resource. enjoying it. I, I look forward to each video that, uh, that comes out. I'll put a link in the show notes so uh, you guys can uh, go straight over there. Uh, you also do a, a portfolio review, uh, ruralinvestmentmedia.com. You put in your natural resource stocks. Um, Absolutely. Anybody who cares what I have to say about natural resources that are of interest to them, which is to say their own portfolio, are encouraged to go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com. And I'll rank your portfolio, at least those ones where I know. I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. Two, I have a new service for speculators, accredited speculators, where for free, uh, so far, uh, I give you information on the private placements in the natural resource space I'm doing. No guarantee because I get in it that you'll get in it, but I will tell you what I'm doing with my own money and why in fairly concise fashion. And then, <laughs> as as you know, I can't help myself in retirement. Uh, I'm backing guys starting a new bank. So if people care about banks, uh, old-fashioned banks, ones that have money in them, that lend against good collateral like gold and silver, uh, when you're at the rural investment media thing, if you care about my private placements, in the question and comment section, write placements. If you care about our new bank, write bank. Uh, we'll put you on the list to get more information. Oh, one other thing. I'm about 350 rankings behind. Uh, and we're in the midst of updating the rankings database too, which is 800 companies. So please be patient getting your rankings. We haven't forgot you. We're just... Uh, we're behind. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Some well, retirement. This has, been, this has been awesome, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, you guys can go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. Uh, Rick, you have a great rest of the day, sir. And thank you again. Thank you. Been a pleasure.